Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Global Immunotalk 2023. I'm Kazeo Mora from Graduate School of Medicine and uh, Rick and IMS Japan. And uh, we are very excited to have Chiara Romagnani uh, for today's speaker. But uh, before moving to um, uh, today's her talk, uh, I have two announcements. Uh, and first, um, please note that uh, we won't get the real time question in this seminar series. So if you have a question for Chiara, please uh, make the question through the Twitter. So I'm gonna um, explain how to do uh, this uh, Twitter uh, after Kiara's talk. And secondly, uh, next week's speaker will be Mark Schromchik uh, from University of Pittsburgh, USA. Uh, his talk title is um, Genetic Dissection of the TRR Paradox in SLC. Uh, SLE, sorry. Uh, so please uh, join us uh, again next week. So now um, I'm very happy to introduce Chiara uh, Romagnani, uh, who have done so beautiful work uh, on the development of um, natal lymphoid cells, including NK cells and uh, ILC3s. So Chiara studied um, medicine at the University of uh, Florence uh, in Italy and then uh, specialized in oncology at the National Cancer Institute in Genova. After finishing her PhD in immunology at the University of Genova, she got the um, EMBO follow Fellowship, uh, which took her to uh, Berlin, Germany. Uh, for her postdoctoral research at the uh, German uh, Rheumatism Center, DRFZ. And it was during this time uh, that uh, she started um, focusing on the innate immunity and inflammation. At first, she was a um, DFG Heisenberg professor and uh, later become a uh, chair of the Leibniz um, Science Campus uh, Clonic Inflammation. And now she is a full pro professor at Charité University, Berlin. And she is also the director of Institute uh, of Medical Immunology there. Her big achievement in the field of immunology include uh, the uh, identification of signal signals control the development and activation of human innate lymphoid cells, as well as uh, identification of the key future feature related to innate um, lymphoid uh, lymphocyte memory. So all of these um, uh, impressive work uh, led her to uh, getting the ERC, uh, European Research Council Advanced Grant last year. So uh, Kiara, uh, could you uh, now please uh, turn on your camera? Okay, good. So thank you very much uh, for joining to this uh, Global Imno Talk. I really uh, was waiting for this uh, today, today's your talk. So before uh, um, you start uh, your talk, we want to ask uh, one question to you to know what your personality is. So uh, the question uh, which today we want to ask you is what advice would you give to your 25 to 35 years old self? Um, hello, Kazuya. So I hope you can hear me uh, yeah. fine. So first of all, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I mean, to answer uh, this question, um, so I think um, I would um, suggest um, to be actually, you know, not to be a too afraid of making mistakes and 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 actually to you know to be a bit less critical more kind uh, with yourself i think you know mistakes um are just you know good opportunities also to you know to redirect your your life to find the right uh, the right strategy and and i think the real key is rather even whatever you do whether you do a mistake or you at the end you will know you've done the right thing uh, to do things which really for which you're passionate about so i think if you have this and um 
I, I don't think that there is anything, um, you know, in your scientific career or in your life that are really like, you know, fatal mistakes. You can always um, come back and and um, and make the best out of it. And I think uh, so. This is a bit what I would also suggest to the current 25 years old. So, um, you know, don't be don't be so afraid. Don't plan your career every step. Uh, just thinking and this is the eight that the final goal the final goal is not this I think the final goal is really to to do what you really are passionate about and so to be more passionate about science and maybe less programming your career I think this um, you know might be counterintuitive if of course of course we all want that you know the young generations are successful and make careers and or become you know uh, stars in academia but but I do think that um, you know the real the real secret is doing what you really enjoy the most and and then if, if that is what it is then um, your the career might follow yeah it's quite surprising that you want to give that question, uh, like uh, uh, advice to you yourself, because you are always cheerful and kind enough and very positive and wow. <laughs> yeah, but it's not has always been like that. And I okay. think, you know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, good advice to young researchers. So now uh, we, uh, we we would love to uh, listen to your talk. So could you uh, start your uh, sharing the slide? Yes. yes. Let's see. Can you? Okay. Can Perfect. You see this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Do you have? Point? Oh yes, you have a pointer. We can see. Yes. So can you see the mouse? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Or maybe here. Yeah. Better. Oh. Here. And okay. So whenever uh, you're okay, please start your presentation. Yes. Okay. So um, again, thank you very much, uh, really, Kazuyo, for the introduction, as I said, but also every all the organizers um, of this fantastic initiative for giving me the opportunity to to speak today. And I will talk about uh, adaptive features of uh, natural killer cells. And uh, you know, first of all, I would like actually to sort of uh, discuss why. So what. The term adaptive uh, with you, because this is, of course, you all know, is used to refer to you know acquired uh, immunity, so B cells and and T cells, as in a way oppose it to to innate immune system. But but the term is also in a way semantically very rich because it you know reminds also of evolutionary adaptations. And and I think if you think about you know the the pool of the of the naive. Uh, cells of the clonal specificities is generated by you know the recombination um, of the of the receptors. This sort of like uh, resemble is sort of an ecosystem with you know continuous and repetitive external pressure by you know pathogen antigens um, exposure. And uh, and this um, this complex ecosystems actually follows also in a way you know the 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 adaptation rules so it has uh, competition selection and and also inheritance um, so you know we know that um, the the affinity of uh, uh, you know the an unique antigen specific rare range receptor which is expressed on every single clone is one of the major driver of uh, of this uh, of this selection. Uh, in addition, of course, to uh, to to additional mechanisms, and uh, that it's exactly the inheritance of uh, the successful somatic mutation, so the rearranged receptor, together with the you know effector program, which is uh, acquired um, epigenetically uh, during differentiation, um, that confers actually the memory, and this occurs at uh, a clonal level. So we do know that um, that's why, based on this concept, that you know, four key marks of the adaptive immune response are, of course, the expression of uh, specific rare range antigen receptors, um, the fact that there's um, it happens at the clonal level with clonal activation, clonal expansion, that there is an epigenetic remodeling so that the progeny of the cells can inherit uh, this particular program, and it is long term maintained still at the clonal level in a phenomenon which is called uh, memory. Um, however, we have also learned uh, that the innate immune system, in particular the myeloid compartment, but also actually also known conventional immune uh, cells, uh, 
um, can uh, get trained and, and remember previous activations. Um, however, uh, the trained immunity largely differs from, in a way, the adaptive memory because, um, as um, you know, in contrast to the adaptive immune system, uh, they do not express specific rearranged antigen receptors, but rather a broad pattern of uh, germline um, recognition receptors. Uh, and thereby also the adaptation, as well as the epigenetic remodeling, which is actually occurring uh, and which is induced by activation, rather happens at a population and not at a clonal level. At least this is, uh, I think, the general concept. So as discussed, there is um, epigenetic remodeling. Um, uh, however, um, although some long-term imprinting has been described, um, and for example, there is beautiful data showing that uh, there is epigenetic remodeling even at the precursor level. So that this of course would be a, a, a long-term imprinted uh, modification. Um, a lot of the epigenetic also modification um, identified are in a way short-term and, and, and reversible. So maybe not necessarily um, transmitted to the process and so probably selection here would play um, a more minor role. So what about innate lymphocytes? As Kazuo already uh, anticipated, like a major field uh, of research in which we are interested are indeed innate lymphoid cells. And if you're in or ILCs. And if you're not familiar uh, with, with this, I'm sure, and, but you are a follower of this global immunotox, you have probably seen the beautiful talks in October, both of Jim DeSanto and, and actually of uh, Yanni Miosberg. They've shown also this slide. Um, so this uh, family of um, lymphocytes are innate. They, in fact, do not express uh, rearranged receptors, uh, but uh, share with, in a way, the T helper or the cytotoxic uh, T cells um, effector programs, uh, in particular ALC1 um, contribute together with TH1 to type 1 responses against you know, virus intracellular pathogens, the type 2 response of uh, ALC2, which is the innate counterpart of TH2, uh, contribute, for example, to the response to, to, to helminths, as well as, of course, in allergy pathology, and, and um, ALC3 uh, shared with TH17 and TH22 um, uh, the ability to respond to extracellular pa pathogens to, to modify the, the, and regulate the epithelial surfaces. So, um, similar to the CD8 uh, cytotoxic T cells, we have somehow the older member of the ALC family, which are the natural uh, killer cells. Um, and uh, what is actually interested is in, in this population of cells that in contrast to uh, the T cells, uh, these programs, which are um, mentioned here, are actually uh, developmentally wired. So are present already early on during um, differentiation, even uh, in, in, in the fetus. And uh, actually so occur uh, in the absence in a way, for example, of uh, antigenic exposure. So um, my talk, as I said, will be focused mostly on natural killer cells. Uh, natural killer cells, as discussed, are the cytotoxic ones. So um, kill typically um, uh, virally infected or, or tumor transformed cells um, uh, by releasing of uh, granzymes and perforins. So very similar in a way to, the, to how CD8 act, also produce interferon gamma, which is also important in the early defense against infections. And uh, their uh, recognition sensing system is based on a balance balance of um, activating or stimulatory receptors and um, inhibitory uh, receptors. Uh, the inhibitory receptor recognize uh, typically as a general rule uh, MHC class 1 molecules. Uh, and so like this discrimination between self and non-self or let's say danger non-self is um, mediated uh, by the, the balance of this of these two. Uh, when a normal cells express normal uh, amounts of MHC class 1 molecules, the inhibitory receptors will not uh, have um, will will see uh, its ligands and thereby will uh, not kill uh, a, a normal healthy cells. But in case of viral infection or, for example, tumor transformation, where MHC class one uh, downregulation is a common event, especially in herpes virus infection, for example, um, you will uh, have the DNK cells using a mechanism which is called the missing self um, uh, will uh, will then recognize uh, the target the infected cells and will kill it. On the other hand, also because, uh, of course, stimulatory ligands need to be to be there, a tumor or an infected cell will upregulate uh, dangerous signals, like, for example, um, 
molecules which are upregulated uh, in response to DNA damage or ER stress, and these also will induce the killing of the cells. Now, these germline receptors which are expressed on, on NK cells are actually really um, many. So there is many of activating as well as many inhibitory. A lot of the activating receptors, um, some of which are mentioned here, H stands for human, M stands for, for mouse. Um, some of these are conserved between human and mouse, but the majority of, of the receptors are, are not really between human and mouse, although the biology and the function then of the, of the NK cells is very much uh, conserved. So uh, a lot of these receptors I mentioned are actually expressed on um, all NK, on all the pool, uh, typically acting in a way as a, you know, um, a danger sensor or a pathogen sensor. Uh, but some of the activating receptors, as well as some of the inhibitory receptors, are actually expressed in a stochastic manner. So only on some of the uh, NK cells. Um, already giving an, an idea of how actually the, um, you know, the repertoire of the NK is more, is more complex. Um, among the um, um, both uh, activating and inhibitory receptor, you see um, this, these two families. So for the human, the, the KIRS, and uh, for the mouse, the LY49. As I mentioned, LY49 um, is not conserved with the humans. It's actually a pseudogene in humans, but um, the KIRS um, have actually, in a way, taken over um, some of the functions of the LY49. And uh, moreover, there is one particular receptor, the CD94 and KG2C, um, activating and the CD94 and KG2A uh, inhibitory, which I will uh, discuss more in detail later on. In addition to activating and inhibitory receptors, NK also express several cytokine receptors, in particular, uh, the receptor for AL15, AL18, or AL12 are crucial receptors uh, that mediate really NK cell um, activation, expansion, um, both at steady state and uh, during inflammation. So, um, as I mentioned before, uh, NK inhibitory receptor here are plotted different uh, members of this KIR family, as well as uh, the CD94 and KG2A, uh, recognize uh, not one particular HLA class 1 allele, but rather uh, some subgroups of HLA A, B, or C, so of the classical HLA class 1 or the non-classical molecules, such as um, HLA E in the case of CD94 and KG2A. And while at the beginning, because the affinity of this inhibitor receptor for class 1 uh, alleles is quite high, was thought that, you know, the peptide does not really play any role, uh, we do know that actually the peptide really determines or contributes to um, determine the affinity of the interaction between the receptor and, and the MHC class 1. And this is probably even more true for uh, the activating receptors, uh, which um, are somehow counterpart of the, of, the, of the inhibitory ones, which recognize the MHC class 1 even with lower uh, ability compared to uh, the inhibitory receptor, so that probably they are the role of peptides and potentially even of pathogen-derived peptides can be um, of particular relevance. This is still a field, however, which is um, where there's really intense uh, research ongoing. So referring to, to what I was saying before about the fact that ALCs, you know, have effector programs which are already developmentally wired, this also applies for NK cells. So the cytotoxic program, as well as this type 1 interferon gamma program, is acquired very early on. And for example, this is a picture taken from a beautiful a paper from uh, the group of Jakob Michelson, which looked at human um, uh, fetal NK cells, you can see that already during fetal life, they express high levels of periphery in a way comparable to what you see in NK cells in adults. However, uh, there's really uh, in the periphery, NK cells are actually quite heterogeneous. And there is already, for example, in humans, uh, several subsets, um, the so-called CD56 Bright, as well as the CD56 team. And within the CD56 team, some additional uh, uh, subsets like the early CD56 team, which um, suggest that there is actually um, not um, a one terminal stage uh, of, NK, of, of short effectors, but rather multiple stages potentially of differentiation and maturation. While I think it's still highly debated whether the CD56 Bright and DIM are developmentally related, there's certainly consensus about the fact that um, there is terminal differentiation within the DIM. And this is, for example, based on different markers and different groups, including our one, has contributed to that. And for example, CD57 is a marker in 
indicating terminal differentiation in NK, and uh, which is not really much expressed during in fetal life, but is actually acquired um, in uh, some subset of NK cells um, in, in adults, so suggesting that uh, a program maturation, potentially an adaptation, could take place. So what about then uh, the ability to adapt really to pathogen pressure? So uh, this phenomenon has been really uh, extensively studied uh, both in humans and mice, uh, especially in response to cytomegalovirus. So cytomegalovirus, for those of you who are not very familiar with that, is a persistent virus of the herpes family with you know 50 up to 94 percent prevalence worldwide, depending on the countries. So, and our immune system is really crucial in, in keeping the virus in latency and prevent dissemination because uh, this actually can be a fatal event as, you know, we have uh, largely uh, seen in, 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 you know, tumor patients or in HIV uh, patients. Um, so, um, because, of course, of the prevalence and this long-term coevolution of human CMB and the mammalian host, and really so many evidences of reciprocal selective pressure, this host pathogen interaction is actually highly relevant. And, uh, and actually, there was a beautiful paper some years ago of um, Peter Brodin and um, Mark Davis, who actually showed that um, cytomegalovirus has really a major non-heritable influence on the healthy immune system, being a sort of a big bang um, for the adaptive as well as for the innate uh, immune system. So this interest in cytomegalovirus and NK cells not only emerged because of the, of the relevance of, uh, of this um, as um, this host pathogen interaction in, in really for humans, but also for the wonderful work uh, performed in, in mouse. So there's really pioneer papers, which I'm not now here uh, citing all of them, but uh, showing that actually uh, black six mice and only actually black six um, express uh, one particular activating receptor, a uh, Y39H, which is an activating receptor uh, recognizing um, a protein of um, the murine cytomegalovirus, uh, actually one particular lab strain, so the, 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 which is used in the lab, not necessarily all the wild type uh, CMV strains which are present around, uh, recognize one protein, which is M157. And actually, this recognition is really important for um, resistance of Black 6 uh, towards um, cytomegalovirus. And um, and uh, later, uh, later, uh, so the group of uh, Wen Yokoyama uh, described in a beautiful paper, which which uh, I like a lot, what he called the specific and non-specific expansion of uh, ly 39 h um, positive cells. So ly 39 h is expressed in Black 6 on quite a high frequencies, around half of the pool actually expressed it at steady state. But during infection, there is a selective increase of the ly 39 h which is very much uh, visible uh, in, in, in absolute numbers. And um, so following on this on this finding, I think really the papers of um, Joe San when he was still a postdoc in, in Lewis lab and then uh, in Lewis Lanier's lab and then actually all his following work, uh, which I could not cite all, and I just recommend you to read this beautiful review um, from the group and in annual reviews of immunology a couple of years ago. Um, so have really shown in a transfer model that actually um, all the potential of uh, the LY39H positive NK cells, including um, their really expansion, the contraction phase, as well as the memory phase. So uh, clearly there is a, a lot of evidence in, in the murine system that actually um, a subset of NK cells can adapt to um, the cytomegalovirus. What about humans? So the, the original observation connecting in a way um, cytomegalovirus with potential expansion of a subset of NK cells came from the group of uh, lopez Boutet. So in a, really in a pioneer papers um, several years ago now, they observed, they made a very simple observation. They looked at one particular activating receptor, the CD94NKG2C, was actually increased in, um, so the percentage of cells expressing this receptor was increased in cytomegalovirus seropositive individuals as compared to cytomegalovirus seronegative. And this is just here, um, just a fax plot from, from the group, just from one donor, just to let you understand. So generally the expression of NKG2C is, is quite low, 
below generally 20% in cytomegalovirus zero negative individuals, while with high variability among donors, there's actually an extreme variability, but it can reach in certain individuals even up to 80% or something of your repertoire, and these cells are very often CD57 positive, so showing that they also have undergone um, Evaturation. Uh, the group of Louis Lanier then showed uh, looking in during uh, a CMV reactivation or, or primary infection in um, hemopoietic cell cell transplantation that actually this expansion of NKG2C positive cells followed CMV D anemia, somehow giving a sort of a, a, a more direct proof that this uh, two phenomena were in a way connected. And the work of many others, which I cannot now show here directly, but please read all, all the papers, um, have really given us a lot of insights uh, about how these um, cells uh, look like phenotypically. So um, the questions we, we had when we, you know, uh, somehow entered this field and how we contributed to, to the field is really how do NK cells adapt to the cytomegalovirus? Um, in, in humans. So um, can the HCMV remodel the NK cell repertoire in the epigenetic program? Um, which signals drive this remodeling? And is this transient or how is this maintained? So, and so I will, with that, I will summarize really the work of uh, two fantastic uh, PhD um, uh, First, Quirin Hammer, which is now actually at the at the Karolinska, um, and um, uh, Timo Rukat, who um, is now finished his PhD and 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 doing uh, a postdoc, and is really have driven this um, uh, this project to actually really, if I think um, where where it is. So he has been really the, the person um, uh, bringing this forward. Uh, so, and of course, because, you know, we are all uh, dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants, there is, you know, all the concepts which I'm describing here are just a piece of a puzzle uh, composed by many other uh, fantastic scientists uh, within the community. And I think this is really um, a field which um, has incredible contribution from um, different labs. So um, what Timo uh, did in order to understand um, the, um, the 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 level of reprogramming um, of the um, NK cells after cytomegalovirus um, uh, infection. So took this approach. So he actually uh, took um, NK cells from cytomegalovirus seropositive and cytomegalovirus seronegative individuals, and then performed a, a multiomic approach, uh, including surface markers, uh, chromatin accessibility, so by single cell ataxic, and uh, gene expression by single cell RNA-seq. So if you uh, do this approach, and I will just, you know, give you like a, a, with a glance of this, of this data, which, uh, which are published, and I will just concentrate on the single cell ataxic data, um, you can appreciate that um, uh, the single cell ataxic in a way resolves very nicely what we have described uh, as a community before in terms of NK cell subset uh, present at steady state, the so-called CD56 bright, this early dim and, and dim. But what was very, um, in a way, um, uh, striking is that degree of um, epigenetic remodeling, which actually the um, NKG2C positive NK cells in cytomegalovirus seropositive individuals undergone and um, actually in cytomegalovirus positive uh, donors, and I cannot show you now all the data to show that these are exactly the NKG2C positive, but uh, there is really an, a separate cluster which emerges, which um, have really um, a different um, epigenetic program. And what is like the core of and the common features of the epigenetic program of adaptive NK cells, uh, to make a short story, uh, long story short, the, the main um, uh, features is that um, there is a chromatin footprint enriched for uh, AP1 motifs in uh, the all adaptive NK cells. And you can appreciate that this is really quite exclusive of the adaptive. It's not only exclusive of the adaptive, but actually it's shared by all the adaptive uh, cells. So as a sort of a, you know, public common uh, feature of the uh, adaptive NK. So um, if you look 
at actually uh, the peaks which were um, enriched in the adaptive NK cells and having an AP1 motif, we, we found uh, some, uh, you know, uh, regions which we, we were not really very familiar with in terms of NK cell uh, biology. And you can appreciate here there is, you know, in the adaptive NK cell, there's really some very specific, um, you know, peaks which uh, are, for example, at this CAT1 and, and, and AIM2. And, you know, one, once we had this data, we were uh, really um, excited to uh, uh, actually to see that uh, there was um, uh, the group of Ellen Fuchs actually published a wonderful paper um, really uh, giving um, uh, the, the main, in a way, um, signatures of established maintenance and recall of inflammatory memory in um, actually murine skin stem cells in response to um, an inflammatory uh, signal, so to imiquimod um, treatment. These cells also uh, can acquire uh, memory features, and actually one of the really the features of this memory phase in you know a different uh, cell type in a different species are exactly the accessibility at this uh, at these peaks, as well as actually these AP1 motifs, which uh, in a way really represent a sort of a universal hallmark of uh, what um, Elaine Fuchs calls inflammatory memory. So suggesting that really like the cytomegalovirus can uh, induce this uh, memory markers in uh, selectively in a subset of NK cells. So, but which signals of uh, cytomegalovirus can promote this adaptive remodeling? Uh, of course, um, we were interested in understanding whether, uh, you know, NKG2C itself uh, could do that. Uh, and as I want to remind you briefly, uh, NKG2C is the activating receptor, which have an inhibitory counterpart, the NKG2A, both receptor recognize the non-classical MHC class 1 molecule HLA. And actually, as I mentioned before here, the role of the peptide uh, was um, quite clear, at least at steady state. So um, under steady state, especially the inhibitory receptors can actually recognize HLAE stabilized by some non-americ peptides from the leader sequence of other MHC class 1 alleles, which means, you know, the inhibitory receptor can surveil for the amount of class 1 on the, on the, on the cell. However, it was not really clear why the activating receptor would recognize, uh, you know, some, some self-peptides. Um, but um, because there were um, beautiful studies actually already indicating that there were some peptides which could stabilize HLAE, we wanted to test whether this could be um, uh, target recognition for activation and expansion of NKG2C positive adaptive NK cells. And by looking really at and this is work by uh, Quirin Hammer. Um, and uh, when he looked at different sequences from many HCMB isolates, he actually saw that uh, this particular non-americ sequence of the UL40 protein of, um, of this uh, cytomegal human cytomegalovirus strains is highly mutated through different strains. And if you then now test uh, the ability of NKG2C positive NK cells to recognize these different um, uh, peptides, and we have done it in two manners, either by pulsing um, um, HLAE transfected cells with different CMV derived peptides, or by actually infecting endothelial cells with different strains, CMV strains, which have actually always the same backbone, but are just different from one um, for this particular non americ uh, sequence, which encodes for the peptide. We could observe that actually the NKG2C positive NK cells really have a differential ability to recognize the different um, CMV derived peptides, with some which actually are. Uh, really high um, activating, uh, some intermediate activating, and some which are actually not recognized at all. So, and these peptides together with cytokines are have actually the ability to um, promote also the expansion and the accumulation of the NKG2C positive NK cells. Again, so these highly activated peptides is very uh, successful in, in doing that. And how what the peptide exactly do uh, is that um, it actually accelerates uh, the division time and it decreases the death rate. So that then now the NKG2C positive NK cells, which see now the peptide has actually an advantage over the NKG2C negative ones and can um, expand. And this experiment has been done actually in naive NKG2C positive from cytomegalovirus 0 
negative individuals, suggesting that actually the peptide together with the cytokines can be a signal to promote uh, the expansion and then the uh, accumulation of these cells. So knowing that, what um, what the work of um, of um, of Quirin, so um, what Timo then now did is then ask whether the combination of the peptide and the cytokines could actually promote this adaptive chromatin remodeling, uh, typical of the adaptive NK. So again, he took naive NKG2C positive cells from, you know, cytomegalovirus seronegative individuals, which do not have any uh, peculiar epigenetic reprogramming, so not that this AP1 reprogramming. He simulated either with the activating peptides or not, and with cytokines or not, and then uh, performed after a short-term point um, as APSIC, so looking for chromatin accessibility as well as protein markers. And what he actually um, could observe is that uh, indeed there are different clusters forming where cells in the different conditions are enriched. So there is, of course, a large fraction of cells which is not necessarily activated. Then there is a fraction of cells which are activated by uh, cytokines alone, by uh, the peptide, and actually by the combination of the peptide and the cytokines. And now if you look in the different clusters for the epigenetic remodeling, you actually can appreciate that um, indeed the combination of the cytokines and the uh, peptide is the one which induce this um, AP1 um, activity. And um, it's not only just, you know, um, uh, chromatin enriched for AP1 binding sites, but it's a more programmed um, epigenetic remodeling, which is ongoing because if you calculate somehow the prediction score of the adaptive NK cells ex vivo from cytomegalovirus seropositive individuals or the the, the score of the conventional NK, you can appreciate that these cells which were cultured with the cytokines and uh, the, the peptide now can uh, actually acquire uh, a higher uh, score typical of adaptive NK while losing the one of conventional NK, suggesting that uh, really these two signals synergistically promote a more programmed uh, adaptive chromatin remodeling in uh, naive and KG2C positive NK cells and to a certain extent reproduce this um, epigenetic uh, program which is observed ex vivo in cytomegalovirus seropositive individuals. So, um, and this actually is, is, is summarized uh, a bit here so that actually uh, also, you know, NK cells in a way can rely on uh, what we call, you know, signal one, two, and three. I did not discuss much signal two because uh, this was uh, more in, in, in Quirin's paper and also it comes from um, beautiful work from um, uh, Kalle Malberg. Uh, so uh, certainly the recognition of NKG2C um, um, together potentially also with CD2, which actually has, act as a co-stimulatory um, receptor, especially for the peptides with intermediate avidity, can promote the activation of the NK cells uh, together with pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, this signals leads to the accumulation of the NKG2C positive cells, which also undergo an epigenetic remodeling and um, uh, acquiring this typical feature of um, enriched chromatin and AP1 binding sites. So the typical uh, feature of inflammatory memory. So, but um, besides this, uh, you know, sort of uh, common program uh, that uh, these um, signals um, occurring during cytomegalovirus infection could provide to the adaptive NK cells that can, which drive this, this remodeling as shown here. If you now look at um, um, not the, you know, total data integrated from different donors, but actually you look at the different individuals separately. Um, the data were very, you know, puzzling and surprising. So this is how it looks like. And, and you know, at first, this was something which, you know, um, just was completely, um, we were not really able to really understand what, what that meant. But then we thought that it was really important to embrace the complexity of, uh, of this and not just disregard it as, you know, like human donor variations, but actually we wanted really to try to understand what that meant. And as you can appreciate here, you can see that, you know, the blue subclusters, so the conventional NK cell subclusters, which you find both in cytomegalovirus seronegative and seropositive individuals of CD56 bright, early DIM and DIM, are in a way, you know, very similar in every individual um, 
and you know the integration is not so complex but what we you know um, the, the the integration um gave us as one adaptive subcluster of uh, kg2c positive cells is actually the sort of juxtaposition of you know very separate and different uh, subclusters uh, which are different within one individual and across different individuals so, um, you know, and I wanted just to, um, in order to to be sure you you understand what I mean. First of all, I want to make you sure that these, of course, are still uh, all uh, adaptive subclusters. If you look now at what you know, this public uh, signature of adaptive NK cells, which you know is typically. Uh, um, consisting, for example, of the AP1 signature, so this is. Um, Present in every um, in every uh, subcluster, you, you see that there is a clear um, differentially accessible regions which are shared among all the adaptive subclusters as compared to the conventional NK. There are these, you know, typical uh, peaks of. Um, uh, of where of genes with AP1 binding activity, um, which are typical of adaptive NK cells, which are you know, 100% penetrant in every single subcluster in every individual. However, there's uh, really a diversity which accounts for this you know um, separation of the subclusters, which is depicted here. So there are several differentially accessible regions which are really unique for each subcluster in each individual. And uh, to give you like an, an, an understanding of, of how this look like, uh, here is like um, you know, some examples independent of what genes they are, uh, or, or there's really some unique peaks which, um, which are really exclusively present in one particular subcluster of uh, one donor, for example, this peak is only present in this particular subcluster in any other um, of the older donors that we have observed. And similarly, this is just present in this subcluster of this donor and this in this subcluster of this donor. So with a sort of a really um, such a randomness and um, that we sort of call like private epigenetic footprints. And so it really looked that it's not something which is, you know, a shared program of adaptive in cases, but rather really a unique feature of uh, each subcluster. So, um, you know, what, what does that mean? What causes really this private epigenetic diversity within adaptive NK cells? So um, Timo actually made, um, you know, the, the hypothesis that um, this uh, diversity that we observe, this extreme diversity of the adaptive subcluster might be a consequence of a founder effect. So, and, uh, you know, whenever um, this, this founder or, or bottleneck effect um, implies that there is, of course, a very heterogeneous um, uh, population um, and uh, which then, you know, have sort of like a catastrophic e event or in the case of cells, a potentially, you know, a, a selection so that then, of course, the, the heterogeneity is then uh, reduced. And, and then uh, that actually uh, there is a subsequent um, expansion. And if you follow my, you know, insects um, um, uh, comparison, you 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 could un you can understand what I mean that you know this the population of the conventional NK cells will be our heterogeneous pool uh, of cells with you know different um, founder cells with different potential also private epigenetic profiles, and then what we are seeing uh, here in the red clusters would actually be um, you know. Um, uh, single founder cells, which then uh, have potentially undergone uh, selection and then extreme expansion. And this is actually what we're seeing. Now, if this is true, of course, um, this would imply that, you know, the conventional NK cells would should be more heterogeneous. And if we measure actually heterogeneity as a medium within cell type uh, LSI distance, we see that indeed the conventional NK cells are much more heterogeneous compared to the different tree subclusters, which are actually much more focused epigenetically. So these indeed a little bit support the hypothesis that actually there is a sort of a focusing, uh, losing of, of uh, diversity and uh, focusing of um, epigenetic profiling. But then of course, um, in order to be able to see this, you know, single founder cells, which are lost, here, it means that these uh, founder cells have then undergone uh, dramatic uh, expansion, potentially oligoclonal or clonal expansion. And how do you measure actually clonal expansion in, um, you know, 
human primary innate cells, where we do not have, of course, a T cell, um, T cell or B cell receptors. Um, barcoding. So um, we took advantage of um, uh, wonderful technology um, uh, developed um, actually at the Broad Institute um, in the group of um, Rejev Sankaran by actually Caleb Laro and, and Leif Ludwig, um, and uh, which actually have um, used uh, somatic mitochondrial DNA mutations uh, as endogenous barcodes for lineage tracing. And you can use that, uh, they've shown in the paper also for, for human primary cells, um, the mitochondrial uh, DNA is actually, mutation is actually inherited um, in, in the progeny and can serve to mark, uh, they show, for example, of course, in, in, in T cells, in tumor, uh, in tumor cell clones, as well in um, hematopoietic um, uh, progenitors. And so um, we thought this could be the right, uh, you know, um, tool to, to try to study that. And so um, we uh, actually employed um, this um, and looked at the mitochondrial DNA mutations um, using a modification of the protocol within the um, uh, ASAP-seq. And uh, here I show you just one representative um, experiment, but what you can appreciate um, is that um, the um if you look now at the mitochondrial mutations the uh, there are really clear um uh, selective uh, mutations in within each uh, particular clone actually also with high all allelic frequency so basically almost homeoplasmic and uh, this uh, mutations are um, there's a preferred concordance between a mitochondrial mutation and the subcluster and um actually um a mutation is never uh, shared really among the different subclusters, um, really in a way showing that uh, these private epigenetic signatures of each subclusters are um, actually related to uh, clonal expansions. And what we also did is actually that uh, we looked if um, the mm, uh, this um, uh, clonal expansion could be actually stable over time. Uh, so what uh, what Timo did was to take the blood again of uh, this, uh, this individual 11 months after, and now we have also like two years, uh, almost time point. And first of all, repeated the experiment. So doing again, uh, the, um, the ASAP-seq. Uh, so you can appreciate this is not like a duplicate. This is like really two time point at distance of almost one year of the same individual. So there is a clear, um, a conservation of the um, of the epigenetic landscape the, of the three subclusters, but what was very surprising to us is also really that um, the mitochondrial mutations are perfectly uh, maintained, both qualitatively and actually quantitatively. There's almost no uh, change in um, the um, size of the of the different clones. So, and with that, um, sort of come to uh, you know to 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 the end of my talk. So, um, I think you know, I I've shown you several uh, data showing how um, this human, uh, at least in KG two C positive and K cells, can um, recognize specifically different cytomegalovirus strains, get activated by that, and um, get expanded, um, acquire epigenetic remodeling and actually transmit this epigenetic reprogramming to the progeny in a clonal fashion. So, uh, which really implies that, um, you know, um, innate adaptation driven by germline receptor can be clonal and long lasting. I think this is a beautiful example really shown in vivo in, in humans. And, and I think it fits fantastically also with, uh, you know, uh, great work uh, from uh, also, for example, Simon Grassmann and, 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 and Veit Buchholz, which actually have shown in, in mouse in single cell transfer experiments, um, really that single cells can give rise also to, um, uh, to, be, uh, to be clones. Um, and also um, a beautiful work in the macaque, um, by the group of Cindy Dunbar, which actually uh, have shown that um, there are uh, clonal expansion in um, in uh, in the macaque after um, after transplantation of barcoded um, uh, progenitors. Um, so this, um, I think. Uh, of course, means that uh, you know clonal memory cannot cure and also might have evolved independently of your range receptor. So it's not really just like, you know, a peculiar fashion of, uh, of T cells and B cells. And I think that this can really, in a way, help us 
to um, potentially understand and identify novel drivers of cell clonal selection and, and, and cell fate um, relevant, you know, for different cell ecosystems, not only for NK cells, in which, of course, we're particularly interested in, but also in general, also for T cells, for B cells, and for um, other lineages, um, including, of course, um, clonal hematopoiesis. So, of course, there's a lot of outstanding questions and then remains, uh, actually, thanks God, so we can, you know, go on and, and try to, you know, try to understand them and, and figure that out. So we're very interested in trying to understand the dynamics of acquisition and maintenance of innate clonality over time. Of course, what we have done until now is just like, a, you know, a sort of a static picture of, uh, of what is happening, but uh, these are cytomegalovirus seropositive, healthy individuals, and um, and, of course, we... We would like to know instead uh, what happens during acute infection and, and how these clones are um, acquired and, and maintained uh, over time. And this is exactly what we are doing at the moment. Um, you know, we would like really to understand uh, what are the mechanisms of, of clonal selection. I mean, can NKG2C play um, a role into that? We do know that there are also NKG2C negative expansions. So what other receptors can be um, impl impl implied in, in the selection? Um, in the competition, in the maintenance, can there be extrinsic factors, of course, you know, stochastic events of activation, cytokines, but also can there be uh, cell intrinsic heterogeneity, you know, this uh, particular epigenetic landscapes, um, the mitochondrial mutations, potentially somatic mutations, could that um, contribute to, um, to this, uh, to determine uh, the clonal fitness? And, um, and, uh, and finally, um, you know, so why the innate immune system uh, needs uh, clonality and inheritance? Um, so what are really the advantage uh, of that? Could that be that, for example, the inheritance of inflammatory memory is, um, you know, is evolutionary uh, important, especially against, you know, uh, maybe uh, persistence viruses, herpes viruses, such as cytomegalovirus? Uh, this, of course, would... would um, would offer as an opportunity for the immune system, but potentially also like um, a risk. So uh, could then be pathogenic traits of innate clonal memory for, you know, tumor or inflammatory disorders. And, you know, how, how global, how um, uh, this, this phenomenon is can actually also, you know, train immunity to which extent train immunity might be clonal and um, might be linked then to uh, clonal hematopoiesis. So I think um, with that, uh, I would really like to actually thank the people who really did uh, conceived and um, uh, the, the, this work that I've um, had the pleasure to uh, present you today, and, and in particular, um, Timo Rukat. Um, and uh, of course, I've shown you also data of uh, Quirinhammer, um, all the groups, um, and um, actually um, all the, the 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 cooperation partners, in particular um, Life, uh, Ludwig, and, and Caleb Blaro. And with Life, uh, we are still actively cooperating together, um, and uh, all the uh, all the grant, so the funding, and uh, and you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kiara. It was very fantastic uh, talk. And I believe uh, young, many of young people, young researchers uh, encouraged by your talk and wish to join to this field. So thank you very much. And so I'm so sorry that uh, we, we don't have a, a real time question time. Uh, many people want to ask you uh, so many good questions, but uh, so I'm gonna uh, give a, a how uh, the like explanation how uh, people can make the question. So um, so we're gonna uh, take the question through the Twitter. So uh, please search for account Global Imno Talk first and uh, find tweet that say ask question uh, for Kiara here and uh, replay to that uh, Twitter tweet uh, with your question and uh, mention uh, Global Imno. So I I uh, I think uh, Kiara need the time to answer to this question, but uh, hopefully uh, she gonna answer soon. So thank you very much again, and I would like to close today's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kazuyo. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>